so first of all, welcome everybody. Uh, if you need uh, or would like to have the uh, live transcription, that has been um, enabled, so you should have access to that. Uh, if you have any questions about how to access that, do feel free to um, send me a message in the chat. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all to the second installment of our fall talk series. My name is Steven Schwartzer, and I'm the Associate Director for Academic Programs in Fordham University Center for Ethics Education. Uh, the Ethics Center, which is directed by Dr. Celia Fisher, was established in 1999 as an interdisciplinary cross-campus unit at Fordham. Uh, the Ethics Center embodies Fordham's commitment to intellectual excellence, social justice, and human dignity through the promotion of, eth of ethics education, research, and public dialogue. Our programs include an interdisciplinary master's degree program in ethics and society, an advanced graduate certificate program in healthcare ethics, the HIV and Drug Abuse Prevention Research Ethics Training Institute, or REDI, um, and an undergraduate bioethics minor. In addition to these programs, we also offer public-facing ethics and social justice programming that engages people in conversation about issues of contemporary social import, such as today's conversation about disability and access to healthcare. So we would also like to thank Fordham's uh, Research Consortium on Disability for co-sponsoring this session. And I'd like to offer Dr. Sophie Mitra, uh, who provided a really large amount of help in making this event happen. Um, I wanted to um, hand it over to Dr. Mitra for a few brief moments uh, to say something about the Research Consortium. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for organizing uh, this seminar today and for having us as um, co-sponsor of the event. So uh, I'm Sophie Mitra, and uh, together with Rebecca Sanchez and Falguni Sen, who you'll meet uh, soon, um, I uh, direct the Research Consortium on Disability. So the consortium was established two years ago, and it conducts and coordinates re, uh, research related to disability at Fordham to help guide the world on a path towards inclusion. Uh, the people that make up the consortium are in the social sciences, in the humanities, in business, education, law, and social services. Um, we also work closely with the disability studies uh, program, uh, undergraduate minor. Uh, at Fordham. So if you'd like more information uh, about the consortium or about the minor, feel free to reach out to me and I'll um, put my uh, email in the chat box in a minute. So thank you again and I'm delighted to uh, be here and look forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you once again. Um, so now to introduce our panel and moderator and to say a little bit about the procedure for this session. So first, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our two panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Brooke Ellison and Dr. Ariana Planey. So Dr. Ellison is an associate professor and director of the Center for Community Engagement and Leadership Development, or CCE, in the School of Health Technology and Management at Stony Brook University. She focuses on medical ethics, science ethics, and health policy with an emphasis on ethics and policy issues in stem cell research. And Dr. Uh, Ariana Planey is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management in University of North Carolina's Gilling School of Global Public Health and a fellow in the Cecil C. Sheps Center for Health Services Research. Uh, she is a health medical geographer with expertise in measuring and conceptualizing healthcare access, health and healthcare equity, and spatial uh, epidemiology. I am also excited to introduce Dr. Falguni Sen, who will serve as the moderator and discussant for tonight's session. Dr. Sen is director of the Global Health uh, Health Global Healthcare Innovation Management Center at Fordham. So for the first part of the discussion, we will have our two panelists speak about their work on this issue. Then Dr. Sen will give some brief remarks and kick off a conversation between them. And we do hope that everybody else in the audience today will be part of this conversation. And we are really happy to include questions and contributions from the audience. 
For tonight's discussion, we have decided to use the private chat feature for audience questions. Uh, to submit your question, please uh, do it via private chat to me and Dr. Sen. And Dr. Sen, as the moderator, will ask the questions for the audience. Uh, we encourage you to send your questions to us at any point during the conversation. And with no further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Sen and our panel. Hi, Stephen, and, uh, and, and welcome to all of you. Uh, I, I we are going to start with uh, with uh, with Brooke uh, Ellison uh, and her presentation. So we will just get started if uh, if that's okay, right? So, and I will go ahead and share my screen. Wonderful, everybody! Thank you so much um, for this invitation to be a part of this session tonight. For all of you who are um, in attendance and have de dedicated so much some of your evening to this event. Uh, as you heard, my name is uh, Dr. Brooke Ellison, and I'm an associate professor at Stony Brook University. And I focus on kind of a cluster of, of areas, as Stephen had mentioned. I'm a professor of science ethics, of science policy, of medical ethics, health policy, and disability. And they, they seem like they go together, right, kind of logically, but in some ways it seems like they, they're they're contradictory to one another. Um, I also am a woman with a disability. I've lived for the past 31 years of my life with quadriplegia as a result of an, of an accident I sustained when I was just a child, just 11 years old. And that is the vantage point. That's the framework from which I view all of these issues. And I think that perspective has given me some insights into how we need to possibly alter the conversation, how we need to look at all of these things together in order to fully understand them in a, in a comprehensive and complete way. Okay, next slide. So what I'm gonna spend my time talking to all of you about uh, a little bit today is about um, the linkage between science and medicine and even issues of economics and how these forces have helped to or have um, you know, aided in societal perceptions of many different things, disability uh, in particular. And you know, when we talk about science and, and medicine and its, it's um, influence on social per perceptions, very often it comes in the form of policy, public matters of public policy. I'll talk about why that's important in just a bit. Okay, so for as long as there has been science and public policy, these two fields have been really inextricably linked, right? They're very much tied to one another. And that's really often a good thing, right? We want to have public policy decisions that are based in science, that are evidence-based. And we've had um, decades and even centuries worth of po public policy decisions or science policy decisions that have been guided by public policy measures so we could think about things like um, our race to the to the moon, right? That was kind of started by an outwardly stated policy decision that this is something that we were going to commit our resources and our talent to. Same thing with the development of nuclear technology, right? That was kind of the, the product of a um, government funded you know, kind of secretive um, constellation of the brightest scientists on earth coming together to work on a matter of public policy. There were experimentations done uh, in the late 60s and early 70s called the MK Ultra um, experiments, where um, the, the government was attempting to create kind of like a super soldier during the height of the Cold War and did sorts of all sorts of testing on members of the public. And these were all kind of guided by science. Now, for the most part, especially in times like we are in right now, we want to have our public policy guided by evidence and guided by science, but there are times in our history and times even right now when the use of science has been sort of manipulated to create unfortunate policy outcomes. I'm gonna talk about some of those uh, with you tonight and what, why that's relevant to people with disabilities. Okay, go ahead. So science and policy have come together very often to create what's called a knowledge economy, right? It's, it's the, the mechanism by which we 
allow our societies to move forward. Now, when I say societies, I'm talking about societies on a collective scale, but at the same time, there have been instances when science policy decisions have been used to marginalize or subjugate or leave behind or even denigrate certain aspects of the population. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna start by going all the way back to the progressive era. So this is a point in the US history, um, it kind of near the turn of the, uh, the, the 20th century. So the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. And this was a time of a lot of social transformation and social activism. So this was post civil war. And there was a lot of outcry about um, problems that were arising as a result of industrialization and urbanization and immigration and fears of political corruption. And there was this desire to move society forward and to change things and kind of rid ourselves of things that we that many members of society, particularly uh, middle to upper class whites, thought were you know, detrimental to society. Okay, next slide. So this was a time of tremendous political activism, especially among women, right? So this was the time when there was um, a push for women's suffrage. There were a lot of calls for gender equality, right? So these are just some images of what was going on at the time, right? So we want equity, we want um, greater rights. We want a society that's more just. But at the same time, there were some other things going on. So at that time, the height of um, genetics research was really coming to fruition. So a lot of this work in genetics was happening right here on Long Island in the Cold Spring Harbor labs when um, new understandings about how we can breed certain um, species to create a, a better and stronger species. Um, that was being implemented into um, our understanding of society. So this entire field of eugenics kind of was born out of that. So eugenics was an application of genetic, genetics research that is such that if we were to create a um, better individual, we can thus create a better society. So eugenics, the field of eugenics, which had its birth right here on Long Island was kind of outsourced or, or migrated to other countries like Germany uh, and, and other kind of countries in, in Western Europe that use this as a mechanism to divide society. So it promised to eliminate social problems by creating a race of, of more moral, more healthy, stronger, more industrious individuals. And at that time, this idea was used as a, as a mechanism of marginalization for people who were considered inferior. And very often that was in the form of people with disabilities and people uh, and, and, and black people. Okay, next slide. So during this time, and this, this took place really across the country, but most specifically in the South, in the time of reconstruction, right? So there's this, there's this time of significant social transformation. This, this time when we could rebuild ourselves as a society, particularly in the South after um, the Civil War and the devastation that had been kind of uh, created as a result of uh, battles and, and um, social transformation. So this was, so this, idea and this concept was used to subjugate and to marginalize people with disabilities and black people that they had often considered as societal others or um, as what, are, what they would call feeble-minded or imbeciles. And um, the, the point of this entire movement of social marginalization was to, as Francis Galton, who was the head, the, the um, kind of the champion of social Darwinism, so kind of the use of, of evolutionary concepts to change society, um, was to improve the flock or improve the stock. So this came in two different forms, positive eugenics, so the creation of, of 
a, a more stronger and more fit individual for negative eugenics. And the, that included different tactics that science implemented to kind of reduce the likelihood of those who are considered to be inferior. And this took the form of some really kind of atrocious and mind boggling scientific and medical practices that were done right out in the open. Things like forced sterilization, marriage restriction, integration among society, um, restrictions, even euthanasia. So the desire was to use these different mechanisms, to use scientific principles to essentially eradicate an entire subset of the population, fearing that they would cause social downfall. So what was interesting, and why this is so relevant to what's happening in the world right now, is that there, during that time, there was um, significant lack of resources, um, lack of medical resources in particular. And eugenics was used kind of as a, a justification for public health policies that reduced access to health care and even the, the ability to live for people who are thought to be less significant and less important to society. So there were concepts that were talked about right out in the open, like born criminality. So if you were born with a disability, you already had this scarlet letter on you that you were more likely to be a criminal. They drew that, uh, there was research being done that would draw connections between those who uh, society would deem feeble-minded and the, their level of criminal activity. And this constant discussion of and kind of vernacular surrounding people with disabilities as those who we do not want within society grew so much that people with disabilities were considered to be a dangerous group, those who needed to be controlled. They needed to be controlled through these mechanisms of euthanasia or forced sterilization or complete marginalization from society as a whole. And all of this was done with scientific justification and medical justification. In fact, it was often those who were considered to be the most prominent or even closest to those who had disabilities as their champion. These are the people who were championing, championing these ideas. So members of different medical academies in the South would uh, promote these ideas, talk about them um, as if they were scientific fact as if this is how society should be. And the effects of this were significant. Okay, so next slide. So these are just some quick images of, of how this was kind of represented in society. So here are just the educated individuals, as I was mentioning, the kind of icons in society were the ones advancing these ideas of that, that the war that they needed to fight were the ones, there was a war between the able-bodied fit, the ones who should carry society forward, and the disabled degenerate, the one who would drag society down, the one whose very existence was a social detriment, the one whose existence could potentially cause catastrophe. So it was kind of borne out in images like this. Okay, next slide. And then there were attempts to kind of measure this, right, create metrics around this. So here it's an image of somebody measuring the, the skull size of an individual to help to determine whether or not this person was, you know, a low-grade imbecile, a medium imbecile, a high-grade imbecile, an idiot, right? So these kinds of terms that right now we completely shudder at and think are completely unacceptable, these were used and you know, used in a, in a pronounced way to marginalize people to make their existence completely irrelevant or even non-existent. Okay, next slide. So at that time, during the, the, the kind of the end of the progressive era, there was a lot of faith that was being put in science as, a, as, as kind of a, um, an arbiter or a guide for public policy decisions. And science had a kind of a, a 
um, a significant role to play in how that happened. Now, I am a, a, a tremendous devotee and lover of science. I wrote my PhD dissertation on the cultural influ influences on science policy. But in, when that um, when science is used kind of in a manipulative or potentially socially um, marginalizing way, we have to be a little bit more thoughtful about how we use it. All right, so here are some of the social implications, things that were being said at the time by a Virginia physician, right? So people who are really kind of icons in their society, a family or a nation will certainly progress or generate as the issue of heredity. All that's necessary is to repress the production of the better and the higher and to multiply the number of the lower and less fit for two or more or three generations to make national degradation perceptible and terribly real, right? So these were ideas that were being kind of inserted in people's heads. The idea of degeneracy, right? that it actually applied to people of certain backgrounds. So eugenics was used as a kind of the mechanism of separation and forced sterilization to kind of pre prevent this population from being a part of society. All right, we can skip ahead to the next slide in the interest of time. So this is kind of a real telling quote. Science, not lynching, physicians, not mobs, paved the way to social harmony by policing the line separating fitness and unfitness, ability and disability, white and black. Now that's really a sobering thing to say, right? Especially, you know, coming, being viewed or being said by somebody who is as deep a lover of science as, as I am. You know, we need to be mindful of how these ideas can be manipulated and used in incorrect ways. Okay. Next slide. All right, we can skip this one in, again, in the interest of time. So this was so important and why I talk about it in the context of the progressive era is because there was at that point um, a, a tremendous a time of tremendous social transition, right? That was a time when we as society could completely rethink how society was operating. And the years that followed that really bore that out, right? So the years that followed that encompassed the kind of reconstruction of society. So it involved the, the Great Depression and then all that followed thereafter. And there were many programs that were put into place to try to rebuild society in a way that was more equitable, a way that was more just, more inclusive of people in a way that would actually make a stronger country. So part of the New Deal, right? So under the, 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 uh, the uh, FDR administration, Right, the big kind of social works program, one of the biggest was the Works Progress Administration. And that was designed to create jobs for many of the people who did not have jobs, way right, to kind of rebuild our infrastructure. The same conversations we're having as a society right now to alleviate mass unemployment following the Great Depression. Okay, next slide. And the, the WPA, the Works Pro Progress Administration, involved thousands and thousands and thousands of projects, changed the lives of millions of Americans, right? So 650,000 miles of new or improved roads, 382 million articles of clothing, 1.2 billion school lunches. And you can see it all over in all different disciplines in all different segments of society. Okay, next slide. And here are some of the kind of the promotional images, right? The propaganda that was developed at the time, right? People from all different backgrounds, people from doing all different jobs to help rebuild our society. Okay, next slide. Okay, this was all over the place. Images like this are were all over the place. The kind of this middle picture is, is a, is a, a, a graph or a, a representation of where these projects were taking place. And it was all over the country. And the Works Progress Administration was really kind of had its own place there with the same ideas, the same images. Okay, 
but this did not include people with disabilities. It's the idea of people with disabilities being inferior or detrimental to society created this divide between having them included in something as vast as, and, or, and as important as the WPA. And they were simply left behind. the kind of language that was being used, starting with the crippled, to the blind, to the deaf, the feeble-minded, to the disabled, right? Kind of put into a group, people with all different lives, which just kind of made it into one uniform group and the people had very different lives to talk about. And there was this one cultural representation of, of the ideas of eugenics born into the films of the 1930s and the 1940s. One representation was this movie called The Black Stork, where um, a man and a woman were considering getting married. The ideas of eugenics were being kind of espoused by the physician who was treating them. And he, he encouraged the family or the, the parents to kill their baby because of, of fears that the baby was going to be born as defective or disabled and thus a drain on society. And at that time also, this was a birth of what was called rehabilitation ideology that looked at people with disabilities as that who we needed to fix, right? The social, the, the medical model of disability such that people with disabilities could improve their lives purely through self-sufficiency and would then ultimately approximate a, a role in society that was just like everybody else's, by pure fortitude, by pure strength of spirit. And one of the people who was most emblematic of this idea was FDR himself, right? So as a visionary, a, a president as he was, you know, a, a creator of tremendous social programs that would change the face of the country. He was very much emblematic of this idea and he kept his disability hidden very much unless it became a representation of his strength and, and kind of um, indomitability as an individual. And that's detrimental, that was detrimental at the time, but very much of a, a, a culmination of years of beliefs that would, that would precipitate it. All right, so as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk and I am kind of concluding things here, I'm a professor of, of bioethics uh, and I incorporate disability into how I approach this topic. Right now, many bioethics cases are built on um, the lives of people with disabilities such that their own lives have become the problem, right? So we problematize disability at the level of the individual. And we look at how disability kind of creates this um, diminished quality of life. And we make judgments whether or not those lives are worthy of being lived. And all of these ideas emerge out of this medical model of disabilities that, had, that has been years and years and years, if not centuries, in the making and it fails to look at disability as a, as a valuable social construct and part of humanity. And very often these bioethical cases that look at the lives of people with disabilities assume that a disabled life is some kind of inferior or substandard life that we have to place judgment on whether or not it's a life of value, whether or not it's a life that we should consider to be worth living. And even now, even in year 2020, 2021, we're having these very same conversations that took place you know, over 100 years ago. And we need to have a different conversation. We need to have one that's much more based in sociocultural needs and how we as a society can do better. Okay, next slide. And these are just some cases, kind of classic bioethical cases, the Olivia, Olivia um, Elizabeth Fulvier case and the Dex Coward case that look at quality of life and how it had been diminished as a result of disability and what they should do with their lives. And this is really detrimental. 
Next slide. So bringing things to contemporary times, right? So I talked about this other pivotal time in societal history, right? This, this, this time following the Great Depression or right after the Civil War, where there was an opportunity for tremendous transformation. And that didn't include people with disabilities. And we're seeing these very same ideas born out right now. So during the pandemic, people, it exposed many of the social disparities and, and health disparities that people with disabilities face. So they had dis a disproportionate burden of disease from the pandemic to begin with, a lack of access to health care, through the kind of required care that they need to live their lives, a disproportionate lack of information when it came to either test, test, uh, medical testing, COVID testing, telehealth technologies, and they were often victims of a triaging of medical care when resources were at their lowest. So very reminiscent of things that were happening post-Civil civil War. Okay, next slide. But there's a statement in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that should be kept in mind, but not, is not always kept in the forefront of our thoughts when we create policy around the lives of people with disabilities. And persons with disabilities have a right to uh, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. And this is far too rarely seen in how we make our medical decisions. And this happened so clearly during the pandemic when people with disabilities found themselves either out in the cold or encouraged to not seek the care that they needed. So again, just some of the disproportionate effects of the, the pandemic on the lives of people with disabilities and how it's very reminiscent of things that we have seen over and over and over again throughout history. Okay, next slide. So what I'd like to leave you is with is with a, a quote that I think is particularly important and particularly um, revolutionary in how we understand the lives and the rights of people with disabilities. So it's worth being read out loud because it's so powerful. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice, our hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it, walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And I think that that's so important to the, the, the state that the world is in right now, particularly in our country as we debate different policy ideas about how to build back a new, a new world, a new country, and how we need to do it with a, a, a mindfulness to disability and to inclusivity in ways that has never been done before. So I will stop there after running woefully over time, I know, and pass the microphone over to my my colleague and co-panelist. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Brooke. Uh, I'm so happy you ended with the positive note uh, from, from Arunduti Roy on we can walk lightly with little luggage. I hope you're right as we move into the next era. It's, it's a perfect segue from how science and everything else has justified historically so many terrible uh, kinds of classifications and strategies and policies uh, that that we have we have had, and even today with COVID, one thing that struck me was how doctors are still making judgments when there are limited resources on who gets what resources when they're critically ill. And do we really understand how they make those judgment, judgments on the prejudices uh, 
and the kinds of impact that has. And I think it's a perfect segue to, uh, to uh, Ariana Plany's uh, presentation. So without further ado, we'll have a chance to, to kind of combine these two and talk about it at the end. So Ariana, may I just hand it over to you and look forward to your presentation on inequities. Thank you. Let me pull up the slides. Can you all see that? Yes, yes, we can. Great. I am going to minimize the window so I can see my slides. So, um, so today I, I don't need to go over this, but I am trained as a medical geographer um, and I'm currently an assistant professor in the health of Department of Health Policy Management in this public health school here. Um, generally, my research is focused on health and health care inequities um, with emphasis on contextual factors. Um, so I just kind of wanted to start off on a strong note here. Um, how we estimate the contributions of social and health policies to uh, population health is actually premised on both methodological individualism, which is basically the concept that society is made up of individuals and the individual is homo economicus. Um, so there's the idea that society is made up of the rational man who is self-sufficient, independent. Um, and so there's the premise that individuals are not linked inter or linked or interdependent with one another. And also these estimates are also based on the idea that each of those individuals has a normal body. Um, and so the, one of the most common methods is the percent attributable fraction, uh, fraction method, uh, which I won't get into the math of it, but basically you estimate the uh, prevalence of an exposure or an outcome of multiple exposures and outcomes um, with the assumption that they all sum to 100%. Um, in terms of the contribution, their contribution to um, health or disease in a population. Um, at the global scale, the most famous uh, version is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluations, Global Burden of Disease. Um, domestically here in the US, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's County Health Rankings uh, is another example of the, this approach applied to public health um, or population health. Um, and with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation model, they attribute, um, so there, I, 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 in the next slide I'll show you, but um, per their model, physical environment contributes to 10% of um, population health, social and economic factors, 40%, clinical care, 20%, and health behavior is 30%. Um, and uh, on the bottom, I have a reference to, if, you, if you're if you interested in critique of the method, um, uh, Nancy Krieger wrote a nice paper, paper on that. Um, so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation model, uh, basically percent attributable fraction um, that tries to estimate the contribution of health behaviors, clinical care, social economic factors, and physical environment to population health. Um, so what's missing? Um, what's not included in the model, and there's a lot of things that aren't included, because um, with modeling, you also want to be parsimonious. So you want to capture as much as you can using as little data as you can. Um, and what's missing from this um, is actually uh, an accounting of federal and local funding of public health, uh, public health capacity, um, the enforcement of disability rights and law, um, also inequities in access to care at multiple scales and not just, oh, there's X number of physicians in this county. Um, and also the, mo the most fundamental root causes of some of these inequities that we see in, in, within our population, right? Um, policy and legal drivers of racial segregation, and also environmental racism. Um, and to take us, this takes us a look to the healthcare piece. Um, so a lot of times um, when people talk about healthcare, they're usually talking about 
an acute care model uh, where healthcare is episodic, like healthcare use is episodic and it's centered on specific complaints at a given time. So it has a much more short term window and there's far less emphasis on prevention or management of long term conditions. Whereas chronic care is what more people who are sick and disabled may um, have much more need of. Um, and it's typically aimed at managing chronic conditions, um, especially multiple chronic, chronic conditions. And the basis for um, chronic care is accessible quality primary care division with robust referral networks. Um, in health services research, the field I am in now, um, most conceptions of access are based on acute or episodic models of care, but do not, and as such, do not account for like the cumulative cost of accessing and using needed care, especially for people with disabilities. Um, and at a global scale, um, this is, let's see. Okay, sorry, get that out the way. Um, on a global scale, when we think about the divide between acute and chronic, um, actually had pretty serious consequences. Uh, the burden of infectious diseases is much heavier um, in what we call the global south. Um, and um, they also have two cancers that are attributed, attribu attributable to these infections um, is actually much higher in these nations as well. Uh, meanwhile, um, meanwhile they, uh, these are countries that have less healthcare capacity um, and the, the healthcare workers that are trained within their borders are much more likely to uh, migrate and work in nations in the global north. Um, and so we have uh, these multiple intersecting um, inequities in um, health and healthcare. And um, in that regard, um, and this is kind of, it is related, but so when we talk about in the so healthcare decision-making, allocation of healthcare resources, we have to understand that ableism is baked into those decision-making heuristics from at multiple scales. Um, so disability adjusted life years, as many of you may be familiar with, um, it effectively reduces life to economic terms in order to apply the logic of cost effectiveness to medical decision-making at the population level. Um, and it does actually um, commit what we call the ecological fallacy, where you um, impute population level estimations of risk or prevalence or whatever, right, um, to the individual. And so like these population level indicators or a population level estimates are used to make individual decisions in the clinic. Um, and so the disability adjusted life years measure was considered to be a, an important advancement because prior measures only could really consider mortality. Um, but this, uh, the disability life years uh, measure, which essentially, so what it does is essentially discounts the lives, the time of disabled people. Um, so a disability, disability adjusted life year is so you for every year with disability, you, you reduce that life year, you, you reduce their lifespan by one year. It, it's, so it's, it's like right there, right from the bat, you have this collapsing of morbidity with disability. Um, it's just, just medical model, model of disability. Um, and uh, going back to the point I was making earlier in the context of global inequities and in the flow of healthcare workers uh, in global South nations, uh, what this means too is that um, one of the measures, one of the base measures uh, that contributes to that aggregate measure is actually healthcare availability, especially surgeons. Um, low middle class, low middle income countries have a uh, much lower availability of surgeons per population um, than nation than wealthier global north nations. Um, and so what that means is like 
that baked into that measure. And so the people, the lives of people um, in the global south, especially those on the continent of Africa, are um, discounted from the get go uh, because they are underserved or um, or maybe yeah, simply underserved but um, with um, insufficient healthcare um, capacity. Um, here is a uh, chart and it shows um, so on the y-axis is the immigration rate for home trained doctors. So how many doctors trained in a given nation uh, leave? And on that x-axis is the immigration for um, native born doctors. Uh, so those born in the country, but not necessarily trained. I'm not sure how they separate the two. But basically, um, what you see is that um, many uh, low middle income uh, nations actually have very high immigration rates for doctors who are trained within their nation. Um, so for example, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, um, up to 99% of doctors trained within that nation border uh, leave and practice elsewhere. Um, and that has implication for the health of the population um, in the nations that are left behind. Um, here in the US, um, and the this is something I I struggle with myself, where in the US we have what's essentially what you can call the medicalization of disability. Um, and it's baked into social policy, it's baked into health policy. And um, one important prerequisite is access to a doctor, access to a physician who will give you the diagnosis that recognizes your disability in order for you to be eligible for, say, social security insurance and other social programs that basically keep people with disability just at poverty. Um, you know, so, you know, you may have housing, you may have a uh, subsistence level or sub subsistence level income, um, and also food, maybe SNAP, but it's, it's not, uh, there's also this idea that disabled people are not deserving of the same quality of life that non-disabled people who are able to work and people who are earn a living earn wages that are paid to non-disabled people and don't experience ableism in the labor market. Uh, so there's this idea that disabled people are less deserving of the quality of life that is expected for people who are non-disabled. Um, and so that takes us to the question of, when we talk about population health, we have to stop and ask, what is a population? Um, and when we're talking about healthcare access and talking about population health, we're also talking about very, di very divergent definitions of what a population is. Uh, so for example, this is a quote from a 2017 article. Uh, when providers and payers, so payers being insurers and providers being health systems and health uh, care providers, when they talk about population, they are talking about the patient population assigned to them for a year. And that's in part because there's so much churn and turnover uh, within our within insurance networks, and prices are, are renegotiated, networks are renegotiated. So we can't assume that access is stable for people who uh, across from year to year. So usually there's a very short term window in terms of population health intervention by insurers and health um, healthcare systems. Um, because what they consider, what, what their population is changes from year to year. Um, so that is actually a, a real disincentive for actually addressing population health in the, the broadest sense. Um, another definition, um, this is, a, I think, gets more at the how health insurance companies look at what population. Uh, insurance, insurers are now using population health to refer to practically any effort to enhance the health status of their members, so people who are enrolled in their plan. And for example, the trade organization America's Health Insurance Plan offers population health solutions to its health plan across the country. Um, and so uh, in health systems over the past about five years have spent nearly $3 billion 
uh, for these kinds of interventions. Um, their effectiveness is questionable, but there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of money going towards these kinds of population health interventions that are led by a health insurance and health system. Um, and so here's a, um, a model uh, that kind of represents how a health system might conceptualize itself in relation to population. Um, so here at, at the center, you have the patient, and you radiating out, you have, so this is a basically concentric circles. At the center is the patient, radiating out, you have the care team, which is defined as health professionals, family members, and team, which is a nice inclusive de definition. Um, but also the organization, so the, the hospital, the health system, the clinic, nursing homes, all the affiliated facilities and providers uh, within that health system. And well, how they define the um, environment is actually interesting. It includes the regulatory market and policy framework. So um, getting at um, the market, what they consider it to be the market. And so here there's the implicit um, assumption that what, what is the patient population is geograph geographically bound within their market. Um, and so this is kind of a problem because, so for example, in the US, we've had, so at least in the past 10 years, um, okay, how about this? In the, over the past 30 years, we've lost nearly 200 rural hospitals. Um, and that those uh, reductions in access to acute hospitals have been disproportionately in the Southeast region. Um, and so when you define market in terms of geographic proximity to a hospital, um, and you're talking about largely talking about for-profit health systems, we're also talking about abandonment. We're, we're, um, so these, in the last decade, these communities that have lost hospitals have had had higher shares of Black and Latino residents, um, higher income inequality, lower incomes. It, so this, like the, com the communities that are losing hospitals were already disadvantaged. Um, they were also more likely to be health professional shortage areas prior to closure. Um, and so defining market areas based on proximity um, particularly excludes people in remote rural places. Um, and so here, here are these are dots are so these dots are actually hospitals. Uh, so this basically the purple are shows the route uh, that rural residents um, for rural residents in census tracts that have where they have to travel 45 minutes more to access the nearest hospital. Um, and so when we're thinking about access, I, I, I always encourage my students, I always like I mean, you know, in my capacity as a professor. I always um, encourage them to think more expansively about what access is. Um, so if you, if you ever take a, a health policy course on um, access, or there's the classic five A's of access. So availability, the adequacy of the supply of providers relative to need. Um, it also can refer to the spatial relationship between providers and patients. Accessibility, um, distance to care, other system level barriers to or facilitators of help seeking assertive use. Accommodation is the degree to which uh, healthcare systems enable patient entry into healthcare. Um, so, for example, walk in appointments, appointments locked outside of working hours. Uh, affordability refers to the financing, reimbursement, and patient costs associated with healthcare use. Um, and acceptability is also the degree of agreement between patient and provider expectations of and attitudes toward care. And this one is a biggie for disabled people. Um, I remember reading a study, and you, probably, you all probably know, I didn't get to pull the reference, but there was a study a few years back that showed that physicians have much more negative um, perception or uh, projections of the quality of life that people with um, see, spinal cord injuries uh, can have. And so they were much more likely to um, suggest, they were, much more, they were much more likely to discourage patients from seeking more aggressive care. Um, 
where patrons had a much more optimi optimistic outlook uh, about what their life could be, even with this acquired disability. And so that actually gets at some of what Brooke was talking about, where who decides what is a quality of life? What is an acceptable, what is that baseline quality of life that we can expect for disabled people? Um, so we have to ask that, um, especially when it comes to decision making for uh, the, the allocation of care. Uh, another dimension of access, language. Um, in 2003, only uh, to less, about a third of US hospitals were not in compliance with federal regulations, which required them to provide language services. And these were disproportionately located in the West and Southwest region, which has high shares of um, non-English speakers. So in um, healthcare policy, health, health policy and management, the one popular framework is the triple aims framework. And the idea is the idea that you have three aims and so the sweet spot is where they all overlap. So population health, per capita cost and experience, patient experience of care. Um, there are some really important omissions from this framework. One, it does not specifically address inequities in access to care. Uh, so for one, you have to have access to care to have an experience of care. Um, it implies a uh, desired synergy between healthcare and population or public health, but that's not actually often present in practice. Um, and also how health systems define population is very different from how public health practitioners define population. And that's a really important um, task in terms of um, designing and implementing interventions to improve population health. And the last point I think is really important, per capita cost is not a measure that captures the uneven burden of healthcare costs across income, wealth gradient, uh, and even across disability status. Um, let's see. And so affordable, that bit takes us back to affordability. Um, so in the uh, mid 2010s, uh, medical outlays reduced the median income of the poorest decile, so the lowest 10%, uh, so the bottom 10% by wealth, by income level, by 47.6% compared to 2.7% for people in the, the 90th percentile or above. Um, and overall, they pushed about 7 million people into poverty. Um, and there's also a geographic dimension in terms of who has medical debt. Um, it's largely concentrated in rural communities. Um, we see a strong concentration across the rural south, um, across the south, across the southwest. Um, and it's so, so Affordability is something that's often overlooked when people talk about access. Um, and also what we're seeing too is this, this, this divergence where healthcare spending is increasing more quickly for people who are the wealthiest while it um, increases um, for people at the bottom of the income distribution as have actually declined over time. Um, and so what it is, is, uh, is this redistribution of wealth through how we finance healthcare. Um, and so I think I will stop there, but I did have um, one other remark to follow up on Brooke's um, excellent contribution. I would say uh, the history of the progressive era, progressive policy, um, public health and eugenics, you can also contextualize it with the prior 30 years. So in the prior 30 years, um, what we saw was the emergence of what was called the Negro problem, which was often very closely related with a disability problem because um, so many people, uh, so many um, now free formerly enslaved Africans um, were, had acquired disabilities, they had chronic conditions, um, and so what we saw when in the reconstruction era where um, the, the spread of public charge laws because there was a strong debate over, um, yeah, stop sharing. 
It was a strong debate over who was responsible for the indigent and sick among us. Um, and so there was, there was so many, there were debates over who was responsible, who should pay. Um, and so even before this, before emancipation, um, states like Virginia, states like um, New York had public charge laws that required people to, so if you were a slave owner and you emancipated a, uh, so it was before, prior to these laws, it was actually pretty common practice for um, slave slaveholders to emancipate slaves who could no longer be productive or uh, produce profit for them. So basically um, there was a problem of older, disabled, sick, um, enslaved, formerly enslaved black people on the street. And so um, that problem was met with public charge laws that was said, okay, well, the local municipal municipality is responsible for um, addressing the social needs of these people. Uh, but prior to, actually, but specific prior, but post, that was actually post-emancipation. Pre-emancipation, uh, what, what it was, was that these laws required the slaveholders to be responsible for the, the um, enslaved, formerly enslaved people that they treat, who are no longer economically viable or productive for them. Um, after the Civil War, there was a crisis again, where, um, you know, after sustained exposure to toxins and so forth, um, back baking labor, you had all of these, um, all, a lot, so many Black people who had acquired disabilities, illnesses, um, many were older. And so then they were considered to be a social problem because there was a concern, well, at the same time, those there were the physicians who were engaged in eugenics in producing the eugenic discourses that became so prominent in the progressive area. Era, they were arguing that, okay, well, the Negro is going to die out now. They're disabled, they're sick. There's no way they can survive. Let's just let them die out. So there was argument over, okay, do we invest in public health? Do we invest in hospitals? And so um, like the Freedmen Bureau hospitals, they were very quickly disinvested and closed um, in part because doctors and nurses, white doctors and nurses refused to serve black patients. Um, the, so there's what we saw was the debate over who's responsible for the, the health of population. Who do we count as a pop, part of our population? Um, and so I think in that regard, we can't really talk about disability social policy, eugenics, without talking about race. Because so much of the history of disability policy, uh, eugenics, is tied up in racism. Um, and how we understand dis disability is inseparable from how, we, how race has been constructed under racism. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Plany. Uh, let me kick it off, if I may, with some question, a question that I would like both of you to respond to. Professor Plany, you just brought us through a whole global inequity, then getting into inequity at the national level, and you brought it down to the municipality level in terms of who is responsible and how we use the terminology population. How do we define what is a population? And then if, we, if I look at Professor Ellison's, uh, how when she talked about public policy and our history, our terrible history in terms of public policy creation and the role that science has actually inadvertently or consciously played uh, because of our understanding at that time of, of how we define terms. Where do we look for solutions? Because we still seem to look for public policy solutions, despite all their inefficiencies. So my question really is, if I look at your triple aim, Professor Plany, and if I could ask both of you, to comment on if we could correct 
the in uh, not so much the inaccuracies, but the way that per capita cost is defined, the way the experience of care is defined, and the way population health is defined, if we could correct those measures and build it into and depend on public policy to resolve the issues of inequity, especially in terms of the disabled population, is that a way that we could actually get solutions? Is the issue a correction of measures and standards? Or is it a problem of prejudices, perceptions, definitions, systemic issues that go into the creation of policy? What can we learn from history? What can we learn from the present, even in terms of the pandemic? I know it's a very broad question. I have more specific ones, which would be more straightforward and easier later on. So well, I wanted to kick to... it off with a broad question. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to, to start. Um, and as, as a really, really insightful question, a really important question. Um, I'm a believer that science in and of itself is agnostic, right? It is normatively neutral, right? It is a presentation of of facts it is often when it is kind of put in, into um, uh, socially malevolent hands that it becomes a potential um, arbiter or um, metric for marginalization. Um, I think it's, it has been used time and time again as a, as a mechanism of divisiveness rather than one of um, social and societal betterment has often been used as a justification for the basest human instincts when it comes to how we can separate each other or make one group feel superior to another. Right? It's been the justification of um, unfortunate human behavior rather than beneficial human behavior. And I think that's that's kind of a course correction that we need to to make um, I think far too like, we, it would, we would live in a wonderful world if um, the term policymaker and the, the term problem solver were actually synonymous. And I don't think that that is the case as frequently um, as it should be. Um, what I think has been a central problem um, to how disability has been understood in, in, um, over the, the centuries in the United States in particular is that this notion of disability has been tied to production, has been tied to um, you know, economic output, right? It's kind of based in this um, you know, Christian work ethic that, has, that was at the cornerstone of our country's development, that if you were not productive, then you were essentially worthless. And actually that mindset was kind of used as justification for a lot of um, you know, pro-slavery movements, right? That, that, um, that uh, black people were not able to work on their own. So thus they were disabled, right? Kind of so as the point that, that Ariana made for at the end of her, of her um, really important talk, compelling talk is it's right on target that you can't talk about racism without talking about disability and vice versa, because the, there were, one was used to um, justify the other. So I think we need to completely rethink how we have approached humanity. I don't think that that's at the fault of science so much as how we have used our own kind of um, desires to marginalize and desires to create a social hierarchy and use science and metrics as a justification to do that. So we need to rethink how we value human beings irrespective of what their ability might be. And then you find the metrics that justify that rather than justify our inclination to divide and to marginalize and to denigrate. Thank you, Professor Allison. Um, Professor Freni. I don't have an opt an optimist. My optimist, my uh, perspective is not as optimistic as Dr. Allison. Uh, so, for example, um, many of the statisticians um, that we learn about in our statistics course, where it's my methods courses, where you do this. Um, the idea of the normal curve, um, you know, that was 
kind of down and a certain understanding of what population should be, um, what distributions within population should look like, um, what the makeup of a population should be. And so I, I can't, for me, if I try to separate science from eugenics or science from the harmful impacts of policies based on scientific insights, um, specifically in communities of color, disabled, among disabled people. So I guess I would say how you define population, I think you have, we have to be very explicit about how we define population when we talk about population. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for how do we define population. Because for example, um, the public, uh, publicly available demographic, social, economic data are based only on community dwelling adults, community dwelling children and adults who are not institutionalized. So the, the most accessible data exclude disabled people. And the vast majority of resources based on those data. So we do not have good data on um, social and health outcomes uh, among disabled people, among people who are institutionalized, um, because they are not considered to be part of the population. And that's, that's true for so many um, health surveillance surveys um, and cross countries, not just the US. Um, so I, I think we have to be very explicit about what we mean by population, especially when, at, uh, when we're doing empirical work in this area. Yes, and I, and, I, and I guess my question is, suppose we were to correct those and come up with better norms to be more inclusive, would we be able to correct the resource allocation system? Or is there something uh, problematic about taking the quality of life issue and gender and creating some general standards. I will ask a specific question to both of you. I work with doctors a lot during this COVID period and ICU doctors, especially at the time when resources were highly restricted and who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. And this is not just in the US, I'm talking about other countries, third world countries as well as to decisions the doctors have to make. And they would keep on coming up and saying, oh, if only we had a standard protocol, I wouldn't have to worry about how I make these individual based decisions because I don't know whether I'm being discriminatory or not. Yeah. Is the yeah. solution, is the solution finding standardized protocols for care, or is that problematic in and of itself? I think, I think that's, I understand the search for the magic bullet, but I think looking for that universal protocol would really reinforce um, the devaluation of people of color, uh, disabled people. Uh, so for example, medical hot body, um, the idea that you can figure out a certain, you can assign a risk uh, to patients based on the zip code they live in, um, ended up reinforcing inequities and uh, along the lines of racism, ableism, and classism. Um, because these were people who had poor access to primary care, um, more uh, greater exposures to um, health harming, um, well, health harming exposures, um, uh, more disabling events in their lives. And so it became, what happened was that there was this collapsing of geography with destiny and uh, far less attention to primary prevention and actually providing the care where it's needed. Um, so I understand the desire for a universal protocol, but I think what part of it is we need to address how we're financing care. We need to address the spatial allocation of care because these spatial inequities in the accessibility of healthcare services, that's a form of rationing, that's passive rationally. And it has consequences in terms of who survives an ambulance ride, um, has consequences in terms of who can survive a trauma, 
Um, so there's all sorts of outcomes that are hard, that are very strongly shaped by spatial access to care. Um, and what we do know is that like communities of color, people with disability have more um, travel, great, greater travel burdens um, to associate it with accessing care that could save or extend their lives. And so that I think that that uh, is not just about changing the measures, it's about changing the allocation of the resources, these health enabling resources in our society. Right, Ariane, you raised some really important points. And this this was such a traumatizing question. Um, you know, one that that was um, that, that no physician wanted to have to make, you know, whenever we have to implement crisis standards of care, there's the knowledge that there are limited health resources and not enough to go around, that the, the demand for care is going to outweigh the uh, supply of it. That said, there were um, the the ventilator issue in particular um, during the pandemic was at least in part uh, the product of a failure to plan effectively, right? We, there was knowledge that a respiratory born pandemic was at some point in the future and we didn't properly prepare for that. So a lot of the decisions that had to be made, really gut-wrenching decisions uh, that were made were the result of that. Now that said, even if we had um, you know, many more times the number of ventilators than we actually had. These same decisions were, were going to be debated. Uh, the same kinds of conversations were going to be had. You know, there are certain metrics that are used to, to, to kind of, I guess, um, predict who is more likely to survive in a situation that would require a ventilator. Sometime. In, in some of these metrics, it um, has just as 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 Ariana had mentioned in her talk has you know, baked in levels of, of ableism right so if we're talking about ventilator use uh, people who live on ventilators themselves would be kind of kicked out of the equation to start with uh, as um, respiratory failure is one of the factors that would um, kind of predict quality of life moving forward so by by kind of just by virtue of living on a ventilator you would are kind of have your your score decreased by that factor alone. Um, and then it comes down to, you know, what kind of philosophical, what kind of uh, ethical framework we want to take. Do we want to take something that is so kind of calculable, is based on a, a very agnostic kind of hard calculus, which of course is, is what some, how some people feel, or do we want to take one that's more justice-based, looking at the factors that went into how somebody has gotten to the circumstance, to the situation that they found themselves in. And these are, are questions that society struggles with um, for a very long time. And up until now included, people with disabilities have been viewed as, um, as simply not as worthy as, as others because of their, largely starting with their um, measures of productivity, kind of the public charge laws that, that um, Ariana was talking about, right? There's social drains on society. So why should we provide limited resources to them? Now, until we change that social conversation, until people with disabilities are seen in positions of, of power, seen in leadership positions, taking on this very same social roles as just about everyone else, and then the conversation is never going to be had in the in the really effective and important way that it should be had. That their lives are as meaningful as anyone else's, even if they're they're unable to take on those positions. That their lives are intrinsically as worthy as anyone else's, and is are as deserving as being saved as anybody else's. Um, that the conversation is never going to shift out of where the position that it's in. So I've kind of dedicated myself as much as I possibly can to shifting that conversation in, in that way, that people with disabilities have the, the very same talents, the very same capabilities, this very same uh, uh, potential uh, um, opportunities for excellence as does anybody else. And they, their lives are intrinsically worthy, where right? they have an epistemology and an ontology that's worthy of being known. And that's the conversation shift that needs to happen. That's the bioethics conversation that needs to take place. Right, and I guess I guess the question would then be, where and how we create that conversation is a change in medical education 
and in the awareness of policymakers uh, through the leadership that uh, Dr. Ellison, Professor Ellison, that you just pointed out, the need to be in positions of leadership, while at the same time, as Professor Pliny pointed out, really alerting people to the consequences of some of these macro decision-making criteria and the, and the measures that are being used right now. I mean, is that, is that, is, is education something that can allow us to, uh, uh, to move forward in the post, in like the new world in the post pandemic that Arundhati Roy is talking about? Is that, is that what we need to really do? Mm -hmm. both at policy level and at the level of metrics and, and uh, what calculations and research goes into market uh, resource allocation decision-making? I, I think um, it's not that is education something. I think education is essentially everything. Right? And I think it starts with the medical community, right? The ones who have in, very, in, in many ways dominated the conversation as, as it relates to disability, the ones who have been kind of the the framework on which the medical model of disability has been built. Like that's where I think the, the, the lowest hanging fruit lies and then growing from there, right? Having physicians, future physicians understand like the worthiness, the intrinsic worthiness of the, of the lives of people with disabilities and being kind of you know, ambassadors of that message rather than one of you know, medical frailty, one of you know, um, you know, physical insufficiency, you know, one of actual empowerment and helping to, to um, implement and kind of integrate that very belief into the into their the, the the minds of their patients as well, right? People who are newly diagnosed, people who are newly diagnosed with disabilities. So the point that that Ariana had made is very insightful. That you need to have a medical diagnosis in order to be kind of a member of the group of, of disabilities. But with that diagnosis or with that um, kind of new identity, should also come empowerment, and then growing from there. Professor Pliny, would you like to add to that? I think in the interest of time, um, I have to say I, 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 I largely agree with you, Brooke. And I think what it, what it, what's happening here is we're having this conversation at different scales. Um, so you know, as a geographer, I tend to focus on micro level um, you know, problems and interventions. Um, I'm less adept at the conversations about you know, cultural change, interpersonal uh, perceptions of disability. Um, I'm less, well, personally, I'm less attuned to those because they're not as, um, that's not the level uh, that, uh, where I do most of my work. So I think what it is, is we're having similar Good conversations levels. at different scales. Which is what makes it wonderful, actually. A question from the audience related to the education thing that I thought, you know, in terms of global inequities, the question was that there are lots of Caribbean area medical schools who graduate a large number of doctors, but they rarely stay, they go out. And it is one of the things that uh, Professor Plainy that you mentioned when you talked about global inequities the statistics is pretty bad in terms of how many people stay and can take advantage or, or people in their own countries can take advantage of care. What can be done about it, given that the US has such a shortage now of primary care physicians and they are going to attract so many people to come in and take over those roles, what can be done about this? Oh, this is my real house. Okay, so um, we need in the short term, what we can do is um, lobby for increased funding for continued medical education through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Um, they find most residency slots, uh, something about 70%, and the remainder are funded by private philanthropies. Uh, so part, part of the problem is that medical schools are geared towards specialization, academic specialization, so they're not producing primary care practitioners. 
And even those who do go to med school to become prim uh, like primary care provider family doctors, um, they're, disincentivized, they're disincentivized or even discouraged from going that route because, um, because well, in part because of the, the amount of debt they take on and the, and the relatively low pay that family doctors, primary care providers make versus more specialized surgeons, or right? And so, and there's just so many problems there, but they're all exacerbated by this historical lobbying by the American Medical uh, Association the um, AAMC Medical Colleges, I think, American yeah. Association of Medical Colleges. They've all historically lobbied to keep the supply of physicians artificially low to keep physician pay high. Um, but what we need is to increase the supply of physicians domestically so that the U.S. and other wealthy nations are not so reliant on um, immigrant or IMG, so immigrant medical foreign graduate. foreign medical graduates. Medical graduates. Yeah. Um, so in fact, so I think what I think that's something we uh, we here in the U.S. can forget. We benefit from the brain drain from other countries that have trained excellent doctors, um, and these those those IMGs they're disproportionately they're much more likely to serve underserved medically underserved community like rural communities low-income uh, neighborhoods within large urban metros, they're much more likely to fill the gaps that domestically trained doctors here in the U.S. do not. Um, and so I think what we need to do is change the incentive structure, increase the number of medical graduates, um, change how medical school is funded, also change how health care itself is, is financed. So it's like we need really what, what it is an overhaul. We need exactly. to move away yeah. from the idea of the physician as an ultimate authority and move toward the idea of a physician as a public service. Yes, and as a coach, as they say. Uh, the we're running out of time, uh, but I, I have one more question from the audience that I really would like to ask you. You talk, uh, and this is, this is uh, uh, Professor Planey, your, one of your slides, which talked about the five A's of access. If you were to make a judgment call between availability, accessibility, accommodation, affordability, and acceptability as being the most important, would you care to identify which one should be taken care of first? Is there a ranking? I'm not sure you can separate them. They're all interlinked. They all feed into one another, but if I had to say the first one first, um, I would say accessibility. So um, addressing the uneven spatial availability of services, um, but also addressing in, you know, infrastructure itself, so it's like say public transit access, um, so enabling better access, better physical access to the services. Um, and that would include the physical layout of the clinic. So for mm -hmm. example, like audiology clinics, they're notorious for falls because the right. threshold, right? Um, and also oncology clinics, notorious for falls because of the layout. Um, and so just thinking more, more explicitly about accessibility at multiple scales. Professor Allison, would you let, want to give a closing thought? Um, yeah, I, I would. Um, so a lot of your questions, uh, uh, Falcon, you, you revolved around you. Know, how do we change this culture? Right? How do we change these overall? Like, what, what are the tools that we need to, to make the shift? And I think that conversations like the ones that we just had are the first stepping stones to to doing that, right? And these kinds of conversations you, 10 years ago were not being had. You certainly, you know, at the time of my accident, just so 31 years ago, um, we were in a very, very different aesthetic when it comes to disability, right? It was still very much um, a belief that people with disabilities did not deserve to have the very same rights as other people do. Um, I knew that you know, as just a child when I 
fought to get back into um, mainstream public education and was met with a lot of resistance. So these kinds of conversations, even just a few decades ago, were not being had. Mm -hmm. And this is how social change happens, right? They right. said it, it comes down to getting people to care, especially the people who don't need to care about this issue. And that's where um, education comes in. That's where interpersonal relationships, these kinds of intimate conversations about things that matter. That's what gets people to care beyond just themselves. So I teach a course on um, inclusion and innovation. So basically teaching engineering students about how to build inclusion into their future work. And many of them have had no of interaction with or um, you know, affiliation with disability really in any way, but they come to see it as something that's just obvious, right? right? My goodness, we're moving forward in all of these different technological spaces for many people, why not everybody? And that's revolutionary thinking, right? That's where change happens. I think none of us should underestimate the role that we can play in, in manifesting that change. And so I wanna thank everybody who put this panel on. Um, and everybody who was a part of it, anybody, everybody who joined it, because that's real. This is where change happens. So I want to thank everybody for that. And uh, thank you. And I've learned so much. And uh, and I want to hand this over to. I've learned so much from the from both of you today. It's been absolutely wonderful doing at the policy and at the individual levels. Uh, as as Professor Plainy pointed out, we are working at both levels, and that was really very very encouraging as well. So. Uh, I'm going to hand over to to Stephen uh, for uh, for some closing thoughts. Thank you, thank you both very much. Yeah. So so my closing thoughts are exactly what was just expressed. Thank you so much for this really uh, fascinating, informational, uh, really engaging set of talks and conversation. And uh, I really appreciate it. I certainly learned uh, a lot. Um, so uh, please, everyone, give a round of applause. Thank you so very much. And then, uh, yeah, thank you. The, thank you. We will now end the session. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.